Welcome to Exhumed, an underground retrospective of arts and culture in the late 20th century. I am your host, James Wallace. CBGB Roots to Skinny Ties When Nirvana's Nevermind came on the charts in 1991, for those listening to commercial radio, this wall of noise and angst seemed to come out of nowhere. But the truth was that this trio were the final generation and lineage of music that had been occupying the underground scene of the past two decades that mainstream radio chose to ignore. In today's episode, we are going to look back at the long journey that it took for the underground sound to find its way on mainstream charts. In episode two, we are going to analyze what happens when the underground hits the mainstream. The roots of the 80s underground can be traced back to rockabilly rebels of the 50s like Johnny Barrett through 60s acts like the Sonics, the Wailers, and numerous others. The 60s would produce four key artists that would have a massive impact on underground and alternative music for decades to come. The Velvet Underground, The Stooges, MC5, and Captain Beefheart. The combination of noise, nihilism, and melody of the Velvet Underground would influence numerous artists across the spectrum of alternative music. The savage power of the political MC5 and the hedonistic self-destructiveness of The Stooges were precursors to punk and later hardcore. Captain Beefheart's angular atonality would influence numerous indie rock bands in the 90s. These artists would bring their influence on the many bands emerging out of the New York clubs, CBGBs, and Max's Kansas City, New York Dolls, Patti Smith, Blondie, Television, Talking Heads, and the Ramones. A publication would emerge from this scene with the name Punk and would become associated with this collection of bands. The former manager of the New York Dolls would take some of these ideas over to the United Kingdom, where he would set up a new band that would change music forever, the Sex Pistols. The Pistols, along with The Dam, The Clash, and many others, would create a storm that went across Britain and the rest of the Western world. Like an endless feedback loop, the American bands in turn became influenced by the British punks. Bands like the Misfits, the Germs, the Dills, and Canada's the Violetones would take the British angry music and put a North American spin on it. And that is a key point in the music. Anger was present in a way that it had never been in music before. As the Pistols imploded during their only North American tour, so many bands were created in the wake of these shows. But punk rock did not have anywhere the same cultural impact as it did in the UK. In the late 70s, kids were into the Dallas Cowboys and Led Zeppelin, not punk rock. A sound that was the antithesis of punk, disco was taking over the clubs. However, the mainstream record companies took a look at the more commercially palatable bands that came out of punk's wake, such as The Police, The Cars, and old CBGB groups like Blondie and the Talking Heads. This style was dubbed New Wave, and gone were the brutal guitar sounds and outrageous clothing. Now the bands wore skinny ties, played keyboards, and sang in pop melodies like groups from the early 60s. This sound was best exemplified by the song by the knack, My Sharona. The sound of punk had been tamed. Hardcore punk. It is now year zero. But for those who embraced the rebellion, this sound was unacceptable. All across the United States, fans of punk wanted to make it more ugly and in your face. Rather than filter out the rough vocals, these punks would shout instead of sing. The tempo would increase to a ridiculous speed, and the length of the songs would be under a minute. These were not just punks, these were hardcore punks. The first records considered to be Hardcore Punk was Out of Vogue by Middle Class and the Nervous Breakdown EP by Black Flag, both out of California. In San Francisco, the Dead Kennedys emerged, playing at a lightning tempo influenced by surf guitar and sarcastic political lyrics. The Bad Braids 
who had started as a jazz fusion band, changed their sound after hearing the Sex Pistols and played at breakneck speeds that people had not heard before. The name of this genre was taken from the Dio album Hardcore 81, and out of D.C., a band would come into being that defined the genre, Minor Threat. During Minor Threat shows, the audience would be on stage just as much as they were off stage, and they would get back to the dance floor simply by jumping off the stage. Gone were the days of pogoing and spitting at the performers. Hardcore shows were filled with slam dancing and stage diving, as well as full-on fights. Scenes were developing across the country, and bands that were recording and releasing the music themselves. This was the do-it-yourself ethic. Numerous labels were created for bands to promote themselves, SST, Alternative Tentacles, Discord, and later on Sub Pop. Bands would get in vans and travel across the country by finding safe houses in this network of scenes in different cities. The music was the furthest thing away from the mainstream and only got media attention due to the violence it shows resulting in many venues not allowing hardcore shows. The evolution of sound. What happens when you can actually play your instrument well? But the band soon found that playing simple one-minute songs at breakneck speeds could become kind of boring. So the band started experimenting a little more. And when you're playing every night on tour, you can actually develop those musical chops. The Minutemen brought in jazz time signatures and folk protest music. The Meat Puppets revealed their hippie roots and started incorporating country, bluegrass, and the Grateful Dead. Black Flag purposely slowed down their sound, much to the anger of their fans, and started showing the influence of Black Sabbath. And Husker Du decided to sing with melody and reference the 60s psychedelic pop of yesteryear. In 1984, these four bands would release four seminal albums, Meat Puppets 2, My War, Double Nickels on a Dime, and Zen Arcade. Old bands like Niner Threat and the Misfits broke up. Glenn Danzig would create the noisy, metal-tinged goth rock act, Sam Hain. Ian Mackay would be in the more experimental bands like Embrace and Egg Hunt before starting the powerful rhythmic titans known as Fugazi. The sound was changing everywhere, and while some diehards were upset by the change of the sound, others embraced it. Noise underground. What terrible sounds of New York. Back over in New York, hardcore punk was certainly a presence, but there had also been another sound that had been lurking in the seedy clubs since the late 70s. No Wave. No Wave was a kind of anti-music that embraced atonality and in some instances, a complete lack of musicianship. Bands like DNA, T Teenage Jesus and the Jerks, and Mars pushed the extremes of noise. Out of this scene would evolve two important bands, Swans and Sonic Youth. The Swans, left by, led by Michael Gira, will play a soul-crushing, slow dirge music that was heavy and nihilistic, but not metal. Sonic Youth would buy old guitars and string them up randomly with all kinds of alternative tunings. They would insert metal objects through the strings that created unique walls of dissonance. Melodic vocals merged thoroughly with the chaos, creating a sound that was unique and would impact music in decades to come. College rock, the rise of a new listener. Now, since mainstream radio completely ignored these sounds of the underground, the only place available to hear this kind of music was on radio stations of university and college campuses. It was not only hardcore punk that they played on these radio shows. There were bands that embraced a more melodic approach and placed a focus on songwriting. Two of these bands were R.E.M. and The Replacements. R.E.M. out of Athens, Georgia, had a unique sound with jangling guitars and deep thought-provoking lyrics by singer Michael Stipe. The Replacements were briefly a hardcore band before evolving into a sound that appreciated both Big Star and The Faces. The replacement seemed to have all the elements needed for success, but could never cross the finish line due to the drunken, self-destructive antics of its members. R.E.M. would take center stage in mainstream media with their 1991 hit, Losing My Religion. R.E.M.'s lyrical, melodic approach would influence Nirvana, but they did not possess the raw guitar sound of the trio. 
The slovenly slacker image and raspy vocals of the replacement seemed to prefigure what Nirvana would look and sound like in the 90s. Another band that was the darlings of college radio and a big influence on Nirvana was the Pixies, formed in 1986 by Black Francis and Joey Santiago. They advertised for a bass player who was interested in Peter, Mal Paul, and Mary, and Husker Du. Kim Deal was the only respondent. The Pixies created a sound that had surf guitar, soaring melodies, and quiet sections followed by really loud ones. The Pixies were the band that created the song structure that Nirvana would follow. Metal, the ugly underground. Another sound that was also bubbling up was the extreme metal in the underground. Metal was often looked down as dinosaur rock by punks, and metalheads thought punks had no musical talent. But people from these two genres were listening to each other a lot more than one would think. Many metal groups from the early 80s started adapting the speed of punk to their sound and gave birth to a new style known as thrash metal. In turns, bands that were in the hardcore punk camp started adopting the sounds of this style and crossover thrash was born. While the metal bands in the mainstream were full of makeup, hairspray, and pop hooks, the underground metal bands produced a noise that had far more in common with the punks than the mainstream. Dave Grohl of Nirvana was a huge fan of extreme metal, and many people in the underground were listening to the extremes of this genre. Emerging alternative rock, Jane has an addiction. But the classic rock genre as a whole was getting a lot of respect from the listening in public in the late 80s. I remember being a youth in that time and was far more interested in Led Zeppelin and Pink Floyd than anything on mainstream radio. There was even a resurgence of deadheads who were trying to relive the glory years of the 60s. Mainstream commercial radio was not very interested and it seemed that people were looking for something new. There were numerous bands that started to gain some success in this era. Misfit frontman Glenn Danzig formed a band under his own last name and debuted an album in 1988 that sounded like Jim Morrison fronting a mix of Sabbath and Zeppelin. Three bands from Los Angeles would begin to permeate the mainstream in the tail end of the 80s. Faith No More created a sound that fused thrash metal with keyboards, melodies, and even rapping vocals. The Red Hot Chili Peppers, who had been around for a few years, when they hit the charts with their 1989 album, Mother's Milk. The Chili Peppers combined funk, punk, and classic rock with the thickness of a metal production. Jane's addiction brought back the musical proudness of bands like Led Zeppelin and created a big rock sound that was filled with androgynous imagery. This was the band that defined alternative rock and in the summer of 1991, created the music festival Lollapalooza. Jane's addiction headlined and the openers were a wide range of performers from various sections of the alternative music genre and beyond. Rollins Band butthole surfers, hip hop artist Ice-T, Susie Sue and the Banshees, Nine Inch Nails and Living Color. Alternative rock was here and on the cusp of crashing into the mainstream. Grunge, which brings us to the city of Seattle. This specific Northwest city was often missed by major touring bands and was insulated from what was happening in the mainstream. There had been a rich musical heritage that had developed there which included garage rock stalwarts such as the Sonics and the Fabulous Whalers, as well as Jimi Hendrix. In the early 80s, a punk independent scene started to develop with bands like Green River, Skin Yard, and the Melvins. What was unique about the sound coming from this scene was the music referenced punk, metal, 60s garage rock, and 70s classic rock. The amalgamation of these sounds created a sound that featured fuzzy distorted guitar and often bleak, cynical lyrics. Eventually, this sound would be dubbed Grunge by Jonathan Pullman, the co-founder of Sub Pop, the indie label that was releasing many of these bands. Some bands had a sound more towards metal, such as Mother Love Bone, Alice in Chains, and the noisy Soundgarden. Other bands had more in common with Punk and Garage, such as Mud Honey. Major labels began to take notice. Soundgarden released their first major label album, Louder Than Love, in 1989, and Alice in Chains released Facelift in 1990. Both bands were starting to gain followings as part of the growing alternative rock scene. 
That year, the more underground sounding Nirvana signed to DGC Records, a division of Interscope Geffen AMM Records. They released Nevermind on September 24th, 1991. Nobody in the band was aware of the impact they would have on the music industry and the entire decade to follow. People seem to think that they came out of nowhere, but as we can see, they were the final offspring of a long lineage of music that had been brewing in the underground for over a decade. Thank you for listening to Exhum. Tune in to the next episode to see what happens when alternative music goes full-on mainstream. I'm your host, James Wallace. Thank you.